Hey guys, how's it going? My name is CJ. Welcome to a really empty room, only because I'm moving houses, so the apartment's a little bit bare, but that's not gonna stop me from making videos. And so Chinese smartphones have a reputation of promising too much and chronically under-delivering. Manufacturers like Xiaomi and Huawei have gone a really long way of improving this reputation, but there are tons of other less known brands out there who, well, put frankly, fail miserably at this. Funnily enough, these companies have been upping their game quite recently, and the phone that I've been using for the last couple of weeks has been a surprising breath of fresh air. It is the Umidigi S2 Pro. Has a weird name, but could it be a bang for your buck package? Well, let's take a look. As with most unknown Chinese brands, this phone looks to be packing some serious punch, at least on the surface. It sports a premium feeling aluminium build and it's paired with an in vogue 6 inch 18x9 or 2x1 if you're into that screen. It has 6 gigabytes of RAM, it's got an octa-core processor, it's also got 128 gigabytes of storage, and it's even got dual SIM compatibility, which is pretty common with Chinese phones, but it also has micro SD card expansion. It's got an interesting dual camera system that we'll talk about a little bit later. And most impressively and most importantly of all, it's got a 5100 milliamp hour battery bragging of up to two days of battery life. And starting at an impressive 230 US dollars give or take depending on where you buy it it does seem pretty bang for buck to start off with the phone feels really good in the hand and I'll always appreciate a nice aluminium unibody it just feels so much more secure and it inspires confidence unlike our glass counterparts and this sturdy feeling is also helped by the fact that it's bundled with an included case it's not particularly impressive, but it also is due to the fact that it's not exactly razor thin either. And it's probably to house the bigger battery. And I'll always be an advocate for making your phone slightly thicker for the sake of battery life. Also, can I take a second to just appreciate the color of this phone? I think more manufacturers need to be a little bit more ambitious when it comes to their color selections. It definitely breaks the mold when we all we see these days are silver, gold, or black slabs. In any case, the phone has a really nice reassuring heft to it. All the buttons feel nice and tactile. It's got USB-C, but unfortunately it only has one single downfiring speaker. Add salt to injury, it also doesn't come with a headphone jack. It does come with a three and a half millimeter headphone jack adapter. And I guess it should be mandatory in phones that omit the headphone jack. But we are talking about a budget smartphone too, so I wouldn't have been surprised if it didn't include one. On the front, there's a nice six inch full HD plus widescreen 2x1 LCD display made by Sharp. Now coming into this phone, I expected all Chinese phones in this budget to look really average, but surprisingly, it was quite nice. It rocks a nice 1080p resolution, which for phones like this is plenty sharp, and it also has really nice color reproduction. Viewing angles were on point as well, and there was no discernible color shift. I mean, it's no OLED screen, but for the price you're paying, you're getting a really nice display. Except for the pre-applied screen protector, I'm pretty sure it had absolutely no oleophobic coating, so it just smudged the screen and everything looked blurry. So before you start it up, take the screen protector off and you're good to go. Then after you get yourself up and running, you'll notice that the phone sports a skinned version of Android's Nougat 7.0. And as you'd expect from a budget Chinese manufacturer, there are quite a lot of UI inconsistencies and there is no app drawer, which is really frustrating. There's a bunch of OEM bloatware apps, which really don't add that much to the experience. And there's no way of deleting them either. So you're forced to hide them away in a folder somewhere. Usability wise and navigating the phone is it's all right. It's not groundbreaking by any means when it comes to smoothness. And there is the occasional lag, but that's probably expected thanks to its decidedly mid-range Helio P25 processor. You can swipe between app folders, which is interesting. And there's also a newsfeed panel on the home screen, which I didn't particularly care for. Multitasking is pretty decent, and that's probably down to the six gigabytes of RAM. Consuming media on the phone is pleasing. And aside from the single downfiring mono speaker, there really aren't any complaints. What was also interesting was the ability 
ability to tweak the sharpness of the display itself. So usually you can have some settings which change the color temperature and also the white balance. This actually has a feature which actually shows the sharpening of the screen so you can artificially sharpen photos and video. It seemed like an interesting feature, however even at the lower settings it introduced really weird artifacts so I turned that feature off pretty quickly. Overall aesthetic is a little more consistent and pleasing to the eye than other budget Chinese manufacturers. However inconsistencies like the 4G icon showing a different font and size to the rest of the UI is pretty jarring. It shouldn't be that big of a deal but it's definitely noticeable the moment you start the phone up. And overall it just takes away from the experience. Also the proprietary firmware doesn't allow people to install third party launchers which is an incredibly stupid idea and a really big deal breaker for me. Especially if you're someone who loves installing Nova Launcher or any other third party launcher on the Google App Store. If you're gonna lock someone in your own UI experience, you better damn well sure hope that it's worth it and looks the part. And it doesn't. So instead you're stuck with a single UI forever. That is unless you install a custom modded firmware, but then with that you lose the ability to get updates. So it's a win-lose situation regardless. And then talking about losing, the biggest loser when it comes to this phone is photography. So it sports a so-called dual camera system. And I've touched on this before with my Maze Alpha review. It's not really a true dual camera setup, at least not in any real world practical sense. It sports a 13 megapixel main shooter and a secondary 5 megapixel sensor that somehow contributes to having uh, clearer and undistorted photos. Mm. No. The secondary lens to me looks like it's just for show and doesn't really contribute to the photos in any meaningful way. Which the photos by the way are decent in good light but absolutely atrocious in low light. So in the right situations, colours are decent, detail is well preserved and dynamic range is well, all right. The autofocus is on par and it does shoot 4K video, but that's as far as the positives go. There's definitely no image stabilization in any shape or form. And in low light, the image processing is a complete mess. Photos taken in low light are lifeless, colors are muted, and details are as flat as an ironing board. Also, the portrait mode is a complete joke. Like the Maze Alpha, Portrait mode is literally just a circular blurred filter that you can probably find on Instagram or other photo editors. And it in no way uses the secondary camera for depth information. It's a complete waste of space if you ask me and it probably could have used that space to put a bigger battery in there frankly. Which in this phone is its biggest redeeming factor. It sports a 5100 milliamp hour battery which lasts two days. And it holds true to that claim. Similar to the Mi Max 2 that I used last year, this phone reaches at the end of a single day and it has at least 50 to 60% charge left. And there were quite a lot of times I was able to get to the second day and then put it on the charge and it still had around 5% of battery life. There wasn't a native setting built into the phone that lets me see the screen on time, but I would hazard a guess it would easily reach 10 hours. The combination of a mid-range processor, an Android 7.0 and a huge battery and side means you've got a phone that has some of the best battery life I've seen on any phone ever. Then to add to that we've also got quick charge which means that you can charge the phone for about 90 minutes and it goes from 0 to 65%. Now that might seem like a long time but then when you think about 50% on this phone it's pretty much the whole capacity of an iPhone which is pretty good. So what we've got is a budget oriented mid-range smartphone that has a lot of promising specs it promises a lot and certainly delivers in some and fails quite a bit in some others. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. It excels in battery life, but then fails when it comes to photography. The overall experience though is positive. Aside from the camera, the phone does tick a lot of the other boxes. The experience is smooth enough for the price. Battery life is absolutely insane. And aside from the camera, the phone really does tick all the boxes. It's got good performance and it has one of the best battery lives on the market. So unless having a good camera and being able to switch launches is of the utmost importance to you, the S2 Pro is a not a bad option that you can recommend to yourself or a family member. It's certainly a mid-range smartphone that comes at a good price with good specs and it does get the job done. So what do you guys think? Do you think this is a good phone or do you think it's a pretty rubbish option for a mid-range smartphone? Let me know why or why not in the comment section below. As always, 
thank you again for watching this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, give us a like, and if you haven't already, do consider subscribing. Thanks again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. As always, say good day, mum, for me. Cheers.